couple of weeks ago on April the 14th, our 95-year-old friend Winnie passed away. I said friend, but she was really so much more than that to our family. Ever since we uh, first met her in September of 1982 in our first pastoral assignment, Winnie had sort of unofficially adopted us, and we, she became a second mom to us. In the intervening years, we shared so many Mother's Day dinners with her. Now, when he had decided at a very young age to follow Jesus and faithfully followed him for over 80 years, that's a long time. There's a cliche, you know, you've used it. She's in a better place. Well, that would certainly be an apt comment to make about Winnie. Even though it's true, well, in fact, that we could say that Winnie is in fact the best place. Those words can tend to minimize another truth. Here it is. I miss Winnie. I'm grieving her loss. Now, you may want to tell me that I shouldn't grieve at all if I, if I truly believe that Winnie is in heaven. Now, the Bible is an extremely practical document. In the midst of his description of what would happen to Christ followers after death, the Apostle Paul made this very, very insightful comment in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Hear it. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Now, it's extremely important to notice that Paul didn't say we aren't to grieve at all, but that we aren't to grieve as those who have no hope. There's a world of difference between those two statements. The Gospels tell us that, that Jesus experienced grief when he stood in front of the empty tomb of his friend Lazarus. In the shortest verse in the entire Bible, we're told that Jesus wept. His friend's death had touched him deeply. Further, we're told that when Jesus was informed of the murder of his kinsman, John the Baptist, he went away. He had to be by himself to deal with his grief. Grief is a universal emotion when we experience a loss. Some of us are presently grieving the death of a friend or a family member. Some of us are, are, are grieving the losses that we have encountered because of the COVID pandemic. I can't get together with my Cornerstone family on Sunday mornings. I'm part of a number of small groups and I and I miss them. Once a month, I've been driving to Prince Albert to visit an inmate in prison. I miss him. Again, let me say, grief is an universal emotional experience. I feel it's extremely important to take this little detour before I go back to the main road, road, a road of heaven is a wonderful place. If we don't deal with our grief, if we just smile and say our loved one is in a better place, we run the risk of causing ourselves harm. The emotional burden of the loss of a loved one, sadness, anger, stress, guilt, regret, numbness, lack of control, sleep deprivation, fatigue, muddled thinking, memory difficulties, disconnection from others, take a toll on the griever. We have to admit that we are grieving and allow the healing Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and to move us towards wholeness. For the past number of years, my friend Linda Redekop has been leading a grief share group. A group had been scheduled to be meeting in mid-March, but COVID made us rearrange our schedule. And the next group has been planned for September, tentatively. Each of us will experience grief somewhat differently. But saying that, I want to suggest that there are some signposts on the road marked grief, some things that most people will go through. Now, these aren't steps like, like moving up a ladder. Rather, they're more like being on an incline. And we can be in more than one stage at a time. Also, we don't graduate from one stage to another. We can move back and forth, and they also aren't necessarily in order. As you go through the grief journey that is in front of you, I want to give you two words to apply to yourself. Are you ready? The first one is patience. 
Be patient with yourself. Allow yourself the time you need. You are different than everyone who has ever inhabited this planet. And your grief, grief process will also be individual and different. The second word is connected. It's kindness. Be kind to yourself. Watch your self-talk. And don't tell me you don't talk to yourself. We all do. I remember being told that it, it's okay to talk to yourself just so long as you don't argue with yourself. Now, I think we all also argue with ourselves as we encounter difficult situations and we try to work through them. I think one of the worst things we can say to ourselves is this. I should be over this by now. Be patient. Be kind. Now, I'm going to reference the work of a woman named uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who observed how people typically dealt with the prospect of their own impending death. But this can also apply to grief as well. What she wrote is descriptive and not prescriptive. By that I mean she wrote about what she had observed, not what each one of us have to do. Here's the first step that she identified, denial. How can you deny death? You can intellectually know that your loved one is dead, but, but you can try desperately to live as though your loved one, well, has just stepped out for a moment. But we'll be back shortly. Some people keep the loved one's clothes in the closet, set a place for them at the table for every meal. Denial only postpones the pain that will come. Next step is often anger. It's an emotion that comes up when we have to face an obstacle. After getting terrible no news, it's, it's not uncommon for our bodies to try to solve things through anger. It can have a lot of victims and targets, including anger to yourself, your doctors, God, or even the loved one. My mother for 10 years was angry with my dad for, for dying and thinking, why did he leave me? The next step can be bargaining. Once you see that anger can't solve the problems, that's when bargaining can happen. You may begin to beg God to give you just one more day, one more moment, one more moment of life with your loved one. Depression can follow. It can show up when the reality of the death grips you and won't let go. But finally, acceptance. Once you've left behind the feeling of powerlessness, you move on to a much less intense, much more neutral state of mind. But that doesn't mean you don't still have your moments. You do. Remember, be patient. When you're in the acceptance stage, you internalize everything that's happened. And then you can lift up your head and look towards the future. You may also start to positively reinterpret the meaning of, of the loss without blaming anyone. It's a long journey and one that shouldn't be walked alone. Allow someone to walk the path with you. That's why being part of a grief share group can be so helpful. But God also offers to walk the journey with us. Now, many of you will remember a poem that was popular a number of years ago. It was called Footsteps in the Sand. I want to close our moments together with the words of that poem. Listen to them. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and, and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me, he whispered. My precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, 
was then that I carried you.